I read you to open your Bible this morning to Genesis chapter 34. We're going to continue walking through chapter by chapter the book of Genesis. So we're in chapter 34 this morning, hearing God speak to us and use his word to redeem us. That's what's happening in Genesis as much as what's happening in the rest of the Bible. God is redeeming a people for himself. You can find that on page 36 of the Pew Bible. If you don't have a Bible, take that Pew Bible. Consider it our gift to you. Would everyone have a Bible? We're hearing God speak from Genesis chapter 34 this morning. This is the word of the Lord. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Give me this girl for my wife. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter Dinah, but his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came, and Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. The sons of Jacob had come in the field as soon as they heard of it, and the men were indignant and very angry because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing must not be done. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him to be his wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us, and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us, and the land shall be open to you. Dwell and trade in it, and get property in it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me I will give. Ask me. For as great a bride price, and give as you will. I will give you whatever you say to me. Only give me the young woman to be my wife. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully, because he had defiled their sister Dinah. They said to them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to ourselves, and we will dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone. Their words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son Shechem, and the young man did not delay to do the thing, because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most honored of all his father's house. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Let them dwell in the land and trade in it, for behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men agree to dwell with us to become one people, when every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them, and they will dwell with us. And all who went out of the gate of his city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. On the third day, when they were sore, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword, and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city, because they had defiled their sisters. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in the houses, they captured and plundered. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me stink in the inhabitants of the land. Canaanites and the Perizzites, my numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, Should he treat our sister like a prostitute? Let's pray again. Holy Spirit, use this word to shape us. We need to be seeing what you see, 
be applying to our lives the redemptive word that's here by seeing what really matters to you, what our hearts should be longing for, what we should be believing. So use the, the new covenant in Christ, Lord Jesus, we pray that your new covenant in your gospel would produce a humility in us to trust in your justice, to trust in your providence, and in your healing hand in the midst of our conflicts. We ask this for your name's sake and your kingdom's purposes. Amen. One word that I think many of us don't really enjoy is the word revenge. That's not a word we use often, revenge. It has the same stem for the word like vengeance or the word avenge. When my kids hear the word avenge, they think of avengers. They think Hulk smash. That's what they think. Or Captain America throwing that shield. How does that shield even work? He throws that shield and he kills the bad guys. They think of Thor and Thor's hammer and lightning bolts crashing down on aliens and things like that. It's easy in those stories when you think about vengeance and justice, that's what the Avengers are trying to accomplish. And it's easy to reach for the good guy in those stories because justice is so clear. You know who the good guys are, you know who the bad guys are. And vengeance is served. But in the real world, it's different, isn't it? One of the things that makes justice in the real world hard to come by sometimes is none of us are perfect judges. Can you imagine being a judge today? We should seriously pray for a Judge Shepherd. I mean, I, I thought about that yesterday to pray, and I saw Rachel Shepherd and thought, what a job she's got. To sit there all day long and try to establish perfect justice. That's a difficult thing to do nowadays because of all the complexities that go into establishing justice rightly. One of the things that they try to figure out when there's a criminal case is motive. That's really hard to do. To establish a motive for why a crime was committed. That's what they were trying to do with the Jeffrey Epstein. You've seen that? That case. And it's more difficult now that he's died. What's the motive? The reason why they are trying to find a motive, they always do, is because it shows the extent, or it can, of the crime so that justice can keep going. Justice can reach as far as it needs to reach to, to help what has been hurt by sin. And God longs for justice, doesn't he? Our God is a just God. He longs for the extent of his justice to heal the earth. Because the earth is so unjust. What makes the earth unjust is sin. It's self-righteousness. It's selfishness. Self-glorification. It's all about the sense of self that motivates the pride that is an injustice against God, isn't it? Because what does God deserve? Humility. Perfect humility from everyone who's ever lived. That's what God deserves. Well, in this passage this morning, it's clear we see God longs for justice. We also see in this passage that the way that God's longing for justice comes about is through the snapshot of man's sinfulness, isn't it? Which is very similar to what we've seen thus far in Genesis. If you haven't been following along with us, and we've been combed through the stories in Genesis over and over and over again, we see that God's people are incredibly sinful. There's a lot of things they do wrong that creates conflict. And yet in the midst of that conflict, God is always there, the just, good, and perfect God, trying to establish justice through man's sinfulness. And Moses, who's writing the story, is showing us two really important things about how God's justice is established through man's sinfulness. And the first real truth that we need to grab onto to understand what God is trying to accomplish is we need to understand that motivations matter to God. The first thing we need to see from this passage. Motivations matter to God. And the second truth we need to grasp onto to see what God's justice is doing through man's sinfulness we need to understand the truth that we should trust in God's provision and justice. That's what God is wanting his people to do here, even though they're failing to do that. He wants them to be trusting in his provision and faithfulness. So these are the two things we're going to be looking at in the passage as we follow through. We're going to look to see how motivations matter, and we're going to look to see how we are called, as God's people have always been called, to trust in God's providence and in God's justice. Motivations matter to God. Let's look at this passage. 
Every one of this passage is motivated by something. It's really easy to see. Just to give you a little context, Jacob at this point, he was called to go to Bethel. But he stayed in Shechem, which is about a day's journey from Bethel, so he's not quite there yet. And he pays the price for it in a big way at Shechem. And so in verses 1 through 4, as Jacob's family is there, they experience conflict instantly by the people in the land. They're trying to establish God's kingdom. They're trying to rebuild what was lost in Eden. And yet they're experiencing conflict immediately. And in verses 1 through 4, we see that one of the first motivations in this passage is the motivation of Shechem, which is confusing, isn't it? Because Shechem's a place. But also Shechem is the name of his Hamor's son. We have Hamor's son Shechem, who's motivated by lust, isn't he? Let's look at verse 1. Now Nine, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this girl for my wife. So that's the first motivation we see. We see this motivation by Shechem to have a wife motivated by a, a, a craving, isn't it? Like a desire, a, a lust, a, a seizing of her. And Jacob's family, they were called to be set apart, weren't they? So it creates an instant problem because they were called to intermarry with the people of the land. So there's conflict. Fast forward a little bit and you see the second motivation. The second motivation in the passage is we see Hamor and the men of the city motivated by greed. So look at verse 23. You can see this when they gather together. It says this. They ask this question. Will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them, and they will dwell with us. Can you see it? So they've got economics on the mind. How can they be expanding their business? And if you notice, in verse 31, there seems to be indicators in verse 31 that Hamor and Shechem, they have ulterior motives with Dinah because of how Simeon and Levi took the exchange. Did you catch that in the end? At the end, but they said this, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? So you see how they're interpreting what's happening? In other words, Shechem wanted to use Dinah as a person for hire, so to speak, so that he could get something else, which is all their stuff. So he could do business with this prosperous family and get more property and wealth and, and all those kinds of things that grow from interacting with them. So we see that motivation, don't we? We see that Hamor and the men of the city are motivated by this greed. And then we see Simeon and Levi are motivated by vengeance, aren't they? Look at verse 25. On the third day, they were sore. Two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. So there's a problem with all these motivations. You've got all these motivations happening, and all these motivations are creating conflict. And the reason why is because in each motivation, there is a touch of selfishness, which always results in conflict. It's not wrong to desire a wife, is it? That's a good desire. Unless there's a motivation of selfish ambition in there. It's not wrong to want to make a buck. Unless there's a motivation of selfish ambition in it. It's not wrong to want to defend a family's honor. Unless there's a motive self selfish motivation that's happening in there. It depends on how you define honor, doesn't it? Motivations matter to God. Because they're going to make the difference between whether or not those relationships are going to result in conflict or result in peace. My children, children are a good example of this. When I tell my children to do something and they say, yes, daddy, okay, daddy, anything for you, daddy, which they don't say. But if they were saying that, all because no matter what they did, I gave them ice cream, then at the end of the day, we have a problem in the relationship. It'd be different if they were motivated by love. Otherwise, how is our relationship established? Is our relationship 
built on the selfish ambition of sprinkles and ice cream? Or is it built on a sacrificial humility of love, children, and respect? That's a much better thing to build a relationship on. One will result in conflict. Because what if Casey Breeze is closed? What are we going to do then? Or one's going to reward to the result in peace, in a restoration, in a healthy relationship. I've heard it said before, even a so-called Christian saying this, that the local church doesn't have the market cornered on grace. I've heard him say that. The local church doesn't have the market cornered on grace. Non-Christians are gracious. Non-Christians are nice. Non-Christians are good. It's true. So what's the big deal? Motivation. Massive deal to God. He cares about the motivation. God doesn't just want us as people to do good things. God wants us to do good things with the right motivation. And if you could put together the summation of what that motivation is, the Apostle Paul says it so well, doesn't he? 1 Corinthians 10, 31, he says this, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all things to the glory of God. That's it. That's what God wants motivating people. His glory. Having a, a passion and a concern for God to be loved and respected and for people to submit to his authority and everything else that makes God glorious. There's a huge difference between doing a good deed with that motivation versus a selfish ambition to do a good deed. And God tests our motivations, doesn't he? God, whether we like to think about it this way or not, actually tests the motivations of everyone on planet Earth. And one day he will do it very clearly when Jesus himself comes and judges the hearts of everyone. The Apostle Paul talked about this. When the Apostle Paul was traveling from church to church and trying to establish a gospel witness in the region of Asia Minor, in the New Testament, throughout his travels, as Paul is constantly preaching on the resurrection of Jesus and, and communicating what it means to believe in Jesus and follow Jesus, he has to constantly be defending himself against people who think his motivation is to deceive them. And so he tells the local church in Thessalonica, really specifically in 1 Thessalonians 2.4, he tells the local church as he's preaching to them, that he doesn't preach to please people. That's not his motivation. And the reason why it's not is because he says this. God tests the heart. God tests the heart. God tests your heart. He tests my heart. If we had two glasses of water up here that looked identical. Both glasses were filled with water. Both of them were full at the top. And one of them was from the nearest sewer. And the other one was full of purified water. None of us would say, well, it just doesn't really matter, does it? Especially if you're thirsty. Or especially if I said we're all going to have a sip of wine. You choose. Of course it would matter. So what would you want? Well, you want to test it. You can buy those testing kits for water purification. And you put those drops in the water, and the one that's polluted, it changes to a different color so that you can see there's a difference between these two glasses of water. Glorifying God or not is tested. How is it tested? What does God do to test us and our motivations? By how we respond to Jesus. That's how he tests it. Do we respond to Jesus with just appreciation for Jesus as a good teacher? And that's it. A lot of people do that, who are good. Do we respond to Jesus as just admiring him for his martyrdom and his self-sacrifice? A lot of people like to come to Jesus, and their appreciation and admiration for Jesus stops by just looking at him as an example. And he's a perfect example of self-sacrifice, and that's it. Or are we different? The way the Bible wants us to respond to Jesus is by responding to Jesus with the love he deserves. The kind of love that worships him as the God man. The kind of love that says, let good and kindred go. This mortal life also. Christ is everything. I have Christ. I don't need anything else. That's the kind of love Jesus wants. 
Are you having that kind of motivation? Whenever I think about people doing good things, if they don't have a love for Jesus, that's submitting all things to him, they got the wrong motivations. And God uses that to test them. When you take a driver's test, 16, 15-year-olds, pay attention. If you take a driver's test, anyone can think the stop sign is a good suggestion. But that's not submitting to its nature. The nature of a stop sign is to stop. Am I right? Don't go to Quincy for this test. They've got too many yields everywhere. Is it a yield or is it a stop? I mean, we're going to get wrecked here. A stop means stop. So we don't treat Jesus as a suggestion, do we? Because that's not really listening and submitting to his nature as the Lord of the universe. And that should motivate us. Do your motivations pass the test? How does everything you do reveal that kind of love for Jesus in all things? We don't seek reconciliation with others when we have a conflict because it'll make our reputations good. Right? That's an easy motivation to have. I don't want to have a good reputation, so I've got to seek reconciliation. We don't parent well to appease the gossip train that goes on in this town. And that gossip train can get on the tracks really quickly, can it? And everyone can know what kind of parent we are, and on and on and on. And so we want to be a good parent because we don't want the gossip train to go around town. That's the wrong motivation. We don't politic in the church because we have this motivation to satisfy our agenda, what we want to do. We've got to get this done. We think this is good. Wrong motivation. The genuine Christian is motivated by a love for Jesus in doing all things for Jesus because Jesus Deserves that kind of motivation, doesn't he? So think of the injustice of not loving him. That's the most unjust thing. Not loving Jesus. It's so unjust. That's why Jesus came to die for the people that hated him. He came to make all things new for them so that they could replace that hate with a love for him. The greatest injustice in the world is not loving Jesus. As the God of the universe who created all things for his glory. So test yourself. You ever do that? Test yourself. Test your motivations. Before you're tempted to gossip, ask, what's your motivation here? Before you're tempted to have that critical spirit rather than a constructive spirit. There's a difference between the two. Ask yourself, what's your motivation here? Before you say no or yes to the next opportunity to serve. Because we have lots of opportunities in the church to serve. And you could say no or you could say yes. Ask yourself a simple question. What's your motivation? That helps us to orient our motivations to do things that glorify God and love Him and serve Him and worship Him through the gospel of Christ rather than something else that might be a bad motivation. Motivations matter. To God. We don't want to end up with this kind of conflict where someone ends up dead, do we? Bad motivation. Motivations matter. The second thing we see in the passage, though, that God's people really need to grasp is to trust God's providence and justice. And we see this at the end of the passage in verses 25 through 31. I've already read part of it, but I'm going to read it again. The whole passage is really escalating to this, this really complicated interaction between Jacob and his sons. And it says this in verse 25. On the third day when they were sore, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in the houses, they captured and plundered. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me speak to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said... Should he treat our sister like a prostitute? What is going on in this passage? Well, among all the things that's happening, Simeon and Levi, they take justice into their own hands, don't they? That, that's very apparent. 
The text may not necessarily make judgments on the virtue of defending their family's honor, which I think they were trying to do in some part, and which we would all agree I think is a good thing. But Simeon and Levi are not so simple models of virtue here. One of the reasons why we know that is because three chapters from now, they want to kill Joseph with, along with their brothers. Why? And we'll get to that whenever we get there. But one of the reasons why is because they probably thought Jacob was treating them unjustly by showing favoritism to Joseph and giving to him what they deserve because they need something, right? So there's this selfishness that's woven in to this really complicated motivation. Another problem here in this passage is they're in, uh, they're, they are operating under some kind of assumption that they're about to be robbed. Do you see that? Because they say in verse 31, that's why they're treating her like a prostitute, because they want to take our stuff. So yes, they want to defend Dinah, and yes, they, you know, they want to bring her back. But they've got a lot of land. They can be prosperous here. They've got a bunch of donkeys and sheep that God gave them, right? I mean, God just gave them. It's not like they earned it. Another issue that's really complicated here is how they killed these men. Did you catch that? It's completely deceptive. They just totally lied to them, basically. It's easy to kill men who've just been circumcised without Advil <laughs> or anesthesia <laughs> because they can't walk. It's a part of a fair fight. Don't. I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> and then they literally took everything those men owned. Everything. They committed murder. But that's consistent with what we've seen in Genesis, isn't it? Abraham's family, they're sinful. That's one thing that's consistent. And the second thing is God still provides in spite of themselves. So if you think about what God did, God did keep them from intermarrying, didn't he? God did keep the covenant. But God did that, even through evil motivation. God preserved them through Simeon and Levi's sinfulness. And the whole point of what Simeon and Levi and Dinah and Jacob should have been doing at the very beginning is trusting the Lord's providence and trusting in the Lord's justice. That's how they're morally responsible to respond to God. It's by continuing to trust. And God would have provided for them so abundantly. Think about how much God continues to provide for his people. When Moses gets on the scene, God is doing things for his people while they are literally sleeping. They are doing nothing. And God is providing abundant redemption over and over and over again. He's acting on their behalf constantly in spite of themselves, to deliver them from their enemies in abundant ways. Their job, their moral responsibility is to live by faith, isn't it? To walk by faith and not by sight. And that's the struggle. That's the struggle. The struggle to live by faith is sometimes like the struggle to save money. It's sometimes like the struggle to eat healthy. It's sometimes like the struggle to pray consistently. There's a delayed gratification, isn't it? It's a delayed gratification, and that can be uncomfortable when gratification is delayed. That's what it means to live by faith. We believe in Jesus. Part of that belief means we believe that Jesus will make all things new one day. All things haven't been made new yet, but we know that's true because of the seed of Newness that's been planted already in our hearts. If you believe that Jesus died for you and rose from the dead, you believe your old self has died with him, dead, gone. The power of sin in your life, undone by what Jesus has done for you. That's the Christian gospel. And what rises is this new self. You've got new desires, new motivations. You've got a, a new purpose in life. You've got a new love, new affections, new values. We know that's true because it's in us. But we long in the world around us to see that manifested, don't we? So there's sort of a delayed gratification because we know that Jesus can accomplish it, and he will. We just need to continue trusting in his providence and in his justice. How do we do that? As Christians, how are we going to do that? One of the ways we do that 
is in a passage of scripture that speaks so clearly to what we just read in Genesis 34. And it's what Paul taught the Roman church in Romans 12, 19, when he said this, Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will refrain, says the Lord. So we're not going to make good Avengers. I'm not going to look at his spandex. I'm not going to carry a shield. Neither are you. We're not going to want thunder to rain down on our enemies. Trust in God's provision. Trust in God's justice. The question is, all right, Pastor Paul, I hear you say that, but is that all I do? Do I just sit around him? Just trust in God's provision? Trust in God's justice? You can stand too and do that. There's a depth to it, isn't there? When we say trust in God's provision and justice, there's an amazing, amazing dynamic to what it is about God's provision and justice that we're actually trusting in. One of the amazing things that's there in God's provision and justice for us in the gospel is a power to live by grace. It's a power to live by grace. So grace in the gospel, when we're trusting in Jesus, is giving us this anointing, if you will. I was trying to find the words this week to describe how it works. It's, it's an anointing upon our lives that touches every part of who we are, that gives us a power. It's like a fresh motivation to accomplish God's will. How does it do that? I'm giving you an example. People may not treat me fairly. They don't treat you fairly. There are things that people say about us and things that they do to us that are actually disgraceful. But we know in the gospel that God, in his grace, always treats us better than we deserve. That's kind of why I say that a lot, right? How are you doing today, Pastor? Well, better than I deserve. Because it's true. All because of God's grace. That's a power that's foreign to me. I don't have any of myself. God gives it to me in the gospel so we can live by that power. And so we carry that with us knowing that our destiny and our identity, who we're called to be, and our purpose, all are defined by God, not this person's treatment of me. Isn't that a blessed hope? I don't have to let unfair and unwise and sinful and hurtful, even if they don't think it is, people or circumstances rule my life. And neither do you. We don't have to be controlled by those forces that feel like chaos around us. We can trust in God's grace. Do you see? We can know that God rules our destinies. That orients our perspective, doesn't it? So when we feel like failures as parents or church members or friends or whatever the world tells us we are, we know that in Christ we are sons of God. Daughters of God. We belong with Him. We've been adopted into His household of faith. We get everything that's good about God just given to us. Whenever we want it, just ask God. Just ask God. And He will act on your behalf because He's gracious to you. God in the gospel rules our lives. It's God in the gospel that removes fear. Think about how much fear people live with today. Not even death can rule your life or my life. And yet people live constantly every day with a fear of death. And it controls them. It morphs their identities, doesn't it? People can become more identified with a fear of death than a fear of God. That's not your destiny in line with the gospel, though. Our destiny is freedom. Freedom from fear. Faith over fear, right? All because of what Christ has done for us through this grace. Let's be empowered by that. You can live differently. So can I. We can speak the truth in love in ways that people around us have never heard in the world. Why? It's because we're empowered by God's grace. That's what's empowering us, not something else. If we're trusting in that provision and in that justice that only the gospel provides. Do you have that motivation this morning? I hope you do. Think about how many problems come into our lives 
when we take vengeance into our own hands with a simple motivation. I mean, the, the amount of damage that causes to our reputations and our relationships and our witness to the gospel, all of which take a lifetime to develop, right, but can be gone in a moment, can all be ruined when we have a simple motivation and yielding justice for ourselves. Another word that we shy away from is not just vengeance, but a word that we shy away from is the word damage. Don't you just hate that word, damage? Of course, we want to know the damage. We have water damage. I've had a lot of water damage before in my house, just from one drip. But the damage it caused was so long, it was really hard to fix it. What I'd like to know is not just the extent of the damage, but what it takes to repair the damage. Doesn't that sound a lot better? Let's repair what's been damaged. Let's repair it. My parents have this big deck behind their house. And the weather over the years has caused all this damage to it. And so instead of staying this year, they said, we're going to give this a more permanent base. And so they had to get rid of the stain in the wood. And so one of the things that they had to do is they had to put this chemical that you can't buy in the store. I don't know where they got it. I didn't ask but they put it on the deck, and it draws out the stain. And then they have to put another chemical on top of it to stop the drawing out of the stain before the wood turns to dust. If you haven't done this before, have you? <laughs> you have done it. Okay. It is really harsh on that wood, but it sets it up, doesn't it, to establish a permanent fix so no matter who walks on it, or what hailstorm comes their way, it can withstand the test. The gospel in us draws out the sin, doesn't it? It pulls the sinful motivations from us. It gives us a much more lasting and permanent fix. So that no matter who walks on your life, and none of us like to be walked on, do we? Or what kind of hailstorm is coming that you can't predict, just like you can't predict the next hailstorm here. But no matter what, you'll be able to stand. Because you're trusting in God's providence. You're trusting in his justice. All by the grace he offers us in the gospel. And that should motivate a thankfulness, shouldn't it? I mean, you could just, you could just sense a thankfulness and a humility so that you don't care about what people think of you. And you can just tell them when they're acting sinfully towards you, you are sinning against me. You can just tell them that. Freely. Helpfully. Not in a way that's con condemning but a way that's true to the gospel so that they can change. Or you can even be able to do something far more than that. And it's what Jesus talked about, didn't he, on the Sermon on the Mount? You might be able to even love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you. Well, how do we have the motivation to do that? God's grace in the gospel to trust in his providence and in his justice that he will establish when he wants. You know that's true. Let's pray. Let's pray and ask the Lord to do this. Holy Spirit, give us a grace. We know that your grace is greater than all our sin. And we want to be a people that see the results of that grace through some really difficult situations. We might be wrestling right now with conflicts in our own hearts about what is true, what is just, what is good. We pray that even in the midst of that conflict, your grace will bring clarity. That there will be a humility that we can even be patient with ourselves when it comes to figuring out what pleases you. Be doing this in our relationships as a church. Be administering your grace to bring clarity. Bring repair to what our sin has damaged. Do that with our relationships in the community. Let your grace bear on our words, on our attitudes. Produce a glory for yourself in us. We ask this in your name.